Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on Just Transitions. It's great to have you with us today. My name is Ben Cahill. I'm a senior fellow with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. And we're really pleased to welcome you to this discussion on Just Transitions. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers and really looking forward to the discussion today. Um, I wanted to briefly go through some housekeeping and, and rules of the game today, and then just kind of outline uh, what's on the agenda. So in terms of the workshop guidance, this is webinar format. Uh, we definitely welcome questions from the audience. We encourage all of you to send questions into our panelists. Uh, we will be monitoring the Q&A uh, and encourage you to send those through and we'll try to work on as many questions as we can into the discussion. In order to do that, the way to send questions is to use the Q&A button. It should be right at the bottom of your screen in the middle. Go ahead and click that and send in your Q&A and again, we'll monitor them throughout. There is a chat function available as well, um, but the way to send your questions through to the speakers and the moderator is to use the Q&A function. You're welcome to use the chat function. Uh, we're very happy to have a, you know, an array of people um, dialing in today from lots of different locations, lots of organizations. So the chat is a great way to share resources and information, send links, uh, start a dialogue. So please go ahead and do that. But if you do want to send in questions, use that Q&A button. Another thing to note here in Zoom, there is a raise hand feature, but we will not see you raising your hand. So if you do want to ask a question, again, Q&A is the way to do it. Feel free to use that raise hand function, but probably no one will see it. Um, and the last note here is that this event is going to be recorded and will be available on both the CSIS and Climate Investment Fund's websites. Um, and we'll share links afterwards and share the resources. So now that that bit of housekeeping is done, let me just briefly run through the plan for this uh, workshop. We have two hours today. We're going to start with a welcome and introduction from Mafalda Duarte, who's the head of the Climate Investment Funds. Um, she will then hand it back to me to do a quick overview of some research that we're doing in the Just Transition Initiative between um, Climate Investment Funds and CSIS. And then we have two panels today. The first panel covers um, gender and informal labor aspects of Just Transitions. Um, we have two great speakers from the ILO and from the University of the Netherlands, University of Clint. And then we have a second session on place-based development plans with speakers from the EBRD, the EIB, and the NRDC. So a great lineup of speakers. We're really looking forward to both. No break, but we're just going to plow through and have two hours of solid discussion. Um, so with that in mind, I think I will stop here and hand it back to Mafalda Dort to get us started. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. And again, you know, on, on our behalf and uh, CSIS, welcome everybody to this a uh, really important uh, webinar um, in a context of what I believe is a very active week this week, Climate Week, there's quite a, a number of events uh, happening. Um, I unfortunately haven't been able to <laughs> well, attend many, but um, <clears throat> I believe this is probably uh, one uh, that will attract a lot of, of interest. Um, <clears throat> let me just give you a little bit of uh, background on this uh, Just Transition Initiative. Um, it is very clear that, um, you know, as we, we go deeper into the, the a climate crisis, um, <clears throat> that we require fundamental change. Um, systemic, what we might call systemic uh, change, uh, quite across, you know, many of the sectors of our economies, um, there will be profound changes needed in terms of behaviors, in terms of how we think about investments, how we think about policies. Um, so we, we are faced with, with a very significant challenge. Um, and, and we are being, what is required to meet the climate goals is to support such deep changes, systemic changes um, in a short period of time, which makes it even more challenging. So we, we need to really make sure that, um, that the workers and the communities are uh, safeguarded against the, the negative impacts, but even more importantly, that they benefit from uh, the opportunities. Um, in fact, you know, this is an opportunity in itself, uh, given that we go through, I mean, when we have crisis and when we are asked to uh, go through profound transformations, those are moments where we can actually try to tackle issues that we have known for a while that need to be tackled. In this particular case, social inequalities or so social injustices. 
Um, but in order to, to achieve that, to achieve, you know, sound climate goals um, and address those social injustices and inequalities, uh, we really need to be deliberate. These things are not just going to happen by themselves. Um, so, so we really need, in thinking about climate action, in thinking about the sort of transformations that will be required, we need to be quite deliberate around what is the but what are the expected impacts uh, in which communities um, and what is it that we need to to put in place and support the countries and the private sector with so that um, we, we we end up with social justice outcomes because if we don't what's going to happen in any case is as we have seen in some countries over the past couple of years is that the people will not be supportive of the reforms agendas um, and will not be supportive of some pretty important measures that align with climate goals. So from an ownership, from a sustainability, from an outcomes point of view, um, this is actually quite important. Um, and what we have, you know, recognized in our work, I mean, we have been working for 12 years now, supporting, spearheading climate relevant investments in developing countries through uh, a group of uh, multilateral development banks who are our implementing partners, is that um, there are a lot of resources out there on a variety of, of issues and more and more resources and information is available. But in this particular area of, of just transition, uh, the resources are quite limited. We can benefit from work that has been done <clears throat> in the development context uh, and, and bring it to bear, but the, the actual uh, resources, tools available um, that speak to this particular agenda on just transition are quite limited. And this is precisely what decision makers and practitioners need. So with this in mind, uh, we established um, this initiative uh, with CSIS. This is what we are seeing here in this slide. And really the objective here is to create this public platform of resources and guidance to support just transition work, um, you know, in countries. Um, we identified, you know, three core goals with this initiative. One is basically a, a primary one was what, what are the different understandings or gaps in understanding around just transitions. Um, and, and Ben will, will outline some of the work we've done here. Um, and we had a, a workshop, a first workshop in June uh, around this as well, which is quite interesting. The second uh, big objective is to offer policy recommendations, um, which is, will be a little bit more the focus of this session today, uh, based on case study analysis, consultations, various consultations that we are also supporting, and of course, uh, literature review. And, and third, you know, foster this community of stakeholders um, for, for knowledge sharing. There are multiple institutions doing work at the moment in this area. Um, and so bringing them together and trying to bring their work together. And with that, you know, certainly, inform the work we do and the work that our implementing partners do. Um, also inform, you know, the broad range of stakeholders we work with from government, from governments to private sector, civil society, indigenous peoples and communities. So to inform uh, all of those, all of those groups. Um, and, and, and try to, you know, exactly what I, as I was saying, foster this, this community. So this is, these are the three key objectives of, of this initiative. Uh, we started off in March this year, and um, I, you, you can see here a little bit of a timeline in this slide. Uh, we have a number of blogs and, and podcasts and, and events um, we have a report that I encourage you to look at, um, which outlines the, the origins of this concept um, and its evolution over time. Uh, 
um, and also uh, includes um, a framework um, that um, I, I guess we will be covering uh, today, but if not, you, you can also see in the documents that are available. Um, the other thing that I have personally found very interesting, and, and this is an effort that we will continue to, to undertake, is case studies. Uh, we are about to release a case study on South Africa. I encourage you everyone to, to read as well. I have done it myself and found it extraordinarily informative and interesting. Um, and we intend to do uh, a few more as well, and not just focused on the energy sector, but focused on other sectors uh, as well. A lot of lessons to draw, to draw from. Um, I'm not going to expand on, on the South Africa case study right now. I mean, we actually had a session in July where there was a, a detailed presentation of, of that study, but um, it, it is a very informative one. Um, so this particular event, uh, is now part of this shift to move from research to more specific guidance and tools. Um, because, you know, our ultimate goal, as I, as I was saying earlier on, is to inform action and inform change. Um, so, as Ben has uh, in, uh, informed all of us earlier on, uh, we will be hearing from a number of speakers that have been doing quite a bit of work in the different areas. And these are very, very critical topics uh, in this broader topic of just transition. So we are, I'm looking forward to hearing from them um, and for some interesting uh, discussions as well. And I, I do, again, um, uh, encourage you to look at the materials available, reach out to us, um, make suggestions, because we are also very open to, to suggestions on how we can make this initiative more relevant for action uh, on the ground. So with that, thank you again very much. Ben, over to you. Right, well, thank you very much, Mafalda. Um, well, I'll keep this brief in the interest of jumping into the panels, but we wanted to briefly introduce some of the research that we've done in more detail. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, uh, what we would like to start with is just some of the initial work that we did on trying to define what just transitions really means. Um, we found that there's been just an explosion of research and interest in this topic in the last couple of years. But the concept of, of just transitions itself is, is a bit difficult to define. And we found that it's a term that really means different things to very different people. It elicits different responses. So initially, when we started the project, we really saw some value in just unpacking what just transitions really means and you know, the, the, the points of reference that people have you know, when coming to the term. So this is a framework for understanding just transitions. And I wanna emphasize here that this is not normative. It's not um, trying to find an ideal definition of just transitions. Really what we're trying to accurately represent here is you know, what definition people have in mind when they, when they discuss the term. So we thought it would be useful to break it down across two dimensions. The first is what we call scope, and the second is social inclusion. Um, and I'll show you in a bit more detail here how different uh, actions uh, break out according to these, these definitions, but it's kind of important to start with first principles. So if we think about the scope of just transitions efforts, you can break it down in two ways. The first is to look at distributional impacts, so who and what is affected uh, by just transitions, uh, by economic transitions generally. Are we talking about small communities, larger communities? Uh, big distributional impacts are, are more narrowly focused. Um, and then it's important to think about intention too. One thing that we found is that when people think about just transitions, you know, some people have a very narrow definition of what just transitions should try to accomplish. So it's really, for example, about you know, protecting vulnerable workers in a certain community. You can think of coal miners in certain communities in South Africa, for example. Whereas others have a very expansive view of just transitions. Um, some people think that you know, we have a system that is ecologically not sustainable. We have political, environmental, social systems that have produced this kind of massive market failure in the form of, of climate change. And just transitions are really the lever that we should use to correct all those imbalances and, and reshape all these underlying systems. So some people really see it as you know, an opportunity to create pretty radical change in the way that we, we govern our economies and our societies. And it's important to capture that spectrum of definitions. And the other element here is social inclusion. Um, this basically means when you're trying to form policies around just transitions, 
who gets to decide what happens and who takes part in the process. And these terms will be familiar to those of you who come from you know, the justice school or the justice scholarship aspects of, of just transitions. The two dimensions that we've listed here are recognition and procedural justice. You know, recognition basically means who's represented in just transitions processes, who has a voice, who's listened to. And the procedural justice, is that particip participation meaningful? So do people from the bottom up really have a meaningful way to get involved in what their future should look like? What alternative livelihoods and pathways are available to them? Those are the kind of dimensions that we try to capture here. Um, this is all part of a first paper that we published several months ago. Um, uh, it's listed on both our site and the Climate Investment Fund site. Uh, we encourage you to check it out. It explains all these concepts in more detail. But again, these are kind of first principles of just transitions. If you go to the next slide, this is just a slightly more detailed way of looking at it. And what we've tried to capture here in the four quadrants, one, two, three, and four, is if you look at these dimensions of scope and social inclusion, you know, this, this gives you a sense of the different types of just transitions efforts that are being tried around the world and the ways that people think are ideal to try to um, use just transitions to capture um, or to try to affect meaningful change. I won't go through them all in detail, but it's really just to underscore that people come at this from you know, very different perspectives. And some people almost want to protect not the status quo because the status quo is not really um, sustainable with, with climate change, but more of a status quo type of approach on the left versus a very expansive, very ambitious approach to just transitions in the top right. So that's a bit of background on just transitions an initial frame, framework that we've developed to understand the term. And now, as Mafalda mentioned, we're kind of pivoting from you know, more general research to more specific concrete tools and objectives that we want to try to offer so that we can do just transitions well. Um, and this is something that we've developed as part of ongoing research. We're working on our second research paper as part of this initiative. And we really wanted to think about what are the, the, the concrete objectives of just transitions efforts and what tools are available to policymakers, governments, civil society organizations, labor groups, and everyone else who cares about outcomes. Um, and the way that we try to break this down is on the left, you can see some things that are sort of enablers for just transitions or cross-cutting principles, like doing good political economy analysis. You know, how do you understand key actors in a certain region or country? what their influence is, their preferences, what they want in terms of just transitions. Um, other things that we think are essential to doing this well are good stakeholder engagement, helping capacity building for various groups, and then impact analysis. So, you know, I mentioned distributional impacts, thinking about who and what uh, will be affected by just transitions efforts. That is important at the outset to make sure you're designing the right kind of policy interventions. But it's also important for monitoring and evaluation throughout the process to make sure that you're gauging what impact you have and on what groups. So these are kind of first principles of just transitions. And then if we think about objectives and tools, this is where we zoom in and get a little bit more concrete. Um, and the, the, the main objectives that we try to capture here are very broad. Things like promoting decent work and labor protections, um, creating good regional development and place-based investment plans, which is something we're going to talk about in a bit more detail later encouraging decarbonization, and then mobilizing climate finance. We've had a lot of discussions about how to do that well. So those are kind of broad objectives. And then if you look at the right-hand side, these are specific tools that we can offer to do this well. And what we're trying to do throughout the initiative and our ongoing research is kind of tackle the complexity of doing all these things. If you look at this list of tools at the right, you know, there's a lot of research to be done on what works and what doesn't and why and in what context. Uh, but these are lots of tools that are available to people. And what we want to do today is talk about two of these issues in more detail. Um, gender dimensions of just transitions and, and the role of informal labor. And then place-based investment, uh, which is you know, the second category here. So the reason why we wanted to dive into these is try to illustrate some of the complexities of doing just transitions and use these two dimensions kind of as a window to, to having that dialogue. Um, and I think with that in mind, it's probably a good time for me to stop here and I will hand it over to Sarah Ladislaw, who heads up the energy program at CSIS. She's going to be the moderator for our first panel. Um, and Sarah, please take it away. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ben. And thanks for uh, everybody who's tuning in today. 
Uh, like uh, Ben and Mafalda said, this is a really important pivot moment for us in this project where we're really turning from what we conceive to be as uh, sort of the conceptual elements of understanding where different policymakers and communities are coming at this issue of just transitions and taking a look, a more concrete look at how um, people uh, around the world in different in different areas are trying to use sort of different tools and strategies for dealing with just transitions. Um, I think the good news for all of us working in this space is that more and more people are talking about the need for just transitions and what that means for them. And we really see it as one of our core jobs to try and be as helpful as we can to policymakers and communities to talk with them about how tools and strategies can be used to actually implement uh, some of these objectives and to learn from other people and communities that have tried to do this uh, as well. So I actually feel like I have a, a great job today. We have an abundance of riches of people who have thought uh, really deeply uh, and, and have a very good experience on working on some of these issues. As Ben said, we've taken two of them, two particular ones that we think are critically important to focus on, but also um, quite difficult actually. Uh, they're, they're not super easy to, to, for policymakers to get their arms around because they're a little bit different, particularly for local policymakers, to think about how they do some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. The only challenge in my job is that we have so many good speakers in a very short period of time. So we thank everybody for their Zoom patience to be able to stare at the screen for this period of time and for all of our speakers uh, to be able to get through which uh, work that deserves uh, full webinars of their own in a short period of time. So for this first panel, we're going to talk about the uh, gender and infor informal labor uh, component pieces of a just transition. Um, we really want to, as I said, focus on the tools and the practical strategies that go along with trying to make sure that gender dimensions and informal labor are considered as we're thinking about uh, just transitions uh, in the context of climate change. So I am very delighted to have two excellent speakers to get us kicked off in, uh, uh, in those topics. Anna Sanchez, who is the Regional Green Jobs Specialist for Latin America at the International Labor Organization. I know we've benefited a lot from the ILO's work on a, a range of different dimensions and so very pleased to have Anna with us today. Uh, and then Joy Clancy, who uh, is from the Department of Governance and Technology at the University of Twente and the founding member of the International Network on Gender and Sustainable Energy. I'm not going to say much more because I think we should get into their presentations. Um, each is going to present. I may ask a couple questions if we have time, and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience for questions. So please do uh, ask questions uh, via the procedures that Ben mentioned earlier. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Anna. Anna, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's it's great to be part of this uh, very important panel and, of course, to discuss about this issue of just transition, informal economy and the gender dimension. So, um, yeah, I, I will go directly to, to present, uh, uh, well, to start with my presentation. So next slide, please. Um, that's where I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, what, what, how, I mean, what's the work that we are doing as ILO in Latin America and the Caribbean and just transition and green jobs. Second thing is uh, we will discuss a little bit about informal, uh, informal employment and how this is related to just transition and, and the specific challenges that we see about that. Um, we'll see a little bit more about the gender issues and we'll share some ideas uh, on policy guidance and, and some tools to address uh, this particular link uh, that is related to just transition. So next, please. This is a very important reminder why us as ILO, the International Labour Organization that we normally work on this work, are working on environmental uh, areas, no climate change and other areas of work. So here you have a, a brief uh, explanation about where is where are where are the links, where where are the environmental challenges, and how those affect the work work. And it's important we have this into account. Uh, some examples: so air pollution. Uh, the problem that we have with air pollution is that it reduces productivity and working hours, mainly in urban areas, because this is those urban areas is where we have the most important, the most prevalent problem, and provoke important uh, diseases, uh, chronic respiratory diseases, etc. cetera. Um, this, is, this has a, a very uh, close link with some of the workers, uh, some of the sector that have to work outdoor 
every day. Uh, next, climate change, uh, thermal stress, uh, which is very important and, and unfortunately is, is increasing, causes loss of productivity. It's already the reducing the working hours and it's worsening working conditions. We all know about the, the increase of diseases and it's, uh, and, and it's affecting uh, some sectors more than others, like agriculture, tourism, all these type of sectors are very much affected by them. Oh, something that we need to take into account, like only in Mexico and the Central America, oh, there could be almost 4 million climate migrants uh, very, very soon. And we are, this is a picture from a very uh, recent uh, march that we had in, in, in Central America from migrant uh, population. Um, and by 2030, we expect that we'll lose almost 3 million full-time jobs in the Latin America and the Caribbean region in those sectors that I have mentioned, agriculture, waste, uh, clean energy, and, uh, sorry, clean energy, no, waste and waste management and the construction sector, okay? So, loss of biodiversity and damages of ecosystems. We can't, uh, we can't forget that an estimated 64 million jobs depend directly of ecosystem services. That means that if the ecosystem does not work well, deforestation and land degradation and some other factors are affecting uh, those ecosystems, we will not be able to have those jobs. Um, and, and the sectors that are uh, greatly affected, again, agriculture, fishing, tourism, industry that depends on water and biodiversity inputs as well. Uh, in natural disaster is uh, as well affecting a growing number of population and this is as well affecting workers and, and this is increasingly affecting workers. So we need to do something about that. And what, what's the problem about that is that most of the sectors that I have mentioned, agriculture, tourism, fishing and others, have very high level of informality. So what that means that all this impact on those workers and on those companies that are acting in, the, in this uh, sector that I have mentioned will have very little uh, possibilities to address those impacts. For example, in, as you know, informal uh, uh, in, people working on the informal economy, they don't have access to, so, uh, to social security systems they don't have uh, the right to collectively bargaining, so they don't have a voice in the decision making. They have uh, lower incomes, they have more variable and more irregular income. So we see that informality is at the center of all these type of pro uh, problems, because when that happens in other regions where informality is not that high, workers still have, and companies as well, still have the, the tools and the opportunities to address them adequately. And, and that's very important to take into account. So next slide, please. How do we work at the ILO? We have very recently launched this ILO Climate Action for Jobs Initiative. We have a website uh, where we include all the information that we want to do and we are already doing. Uh, so I, mean, uh, I invite you to, to go there and take a look to that. Our main goals are uh, enable climate action with decent work and social justice. So very much uh, are the objectives of the, of the Just Transition Initiative that we just heard about. Support countries in the transition uh, that are funded on a broad-based support, something that uh, Mafalda also mentioned. We need to have a broad-based uh, broad support in order for the transition to be a real possibility and facilitate and, 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 and promote an inclusive recovery from COVID-19. Uh, at the right hand side, you have uh, an image of the guidelines of, uh, for, of the just transition guidelines that the ILO constituents, which is workers, employees and the governments, agreed uh, a few years ago, 1915, uh, and which for us is the political framework of our work at the ILO. Next, please. Okay, so how is, the, how is the region, the Latin American, the Caribbean region? Okay, we have done a very, uh, we have 
launched like a month ago, uh, very recently, a new report, uh, ILO and the Inter-American Development Bank together, where we analyze what may be the impact, uh, the job impact of decarbonization in the region. And this is the result. We can create uh, one five, uh, 15 million new jobs. This is uh, new jobs crea created by in 10 years time, by 2030. But there will be winners and losers. And, and here you have in the right hand side who are the winners and who are the losers in terms of economic sectors. We have agriculture and, and plant-based foods uh, that together with renewable energies that will be uh, two of the sectors uh, where most jobs will be created as well forestry. We, however, we also have some other jobs where jobs will be lost, uh, fossil fuel electricity, fossil fuel extraction, and probably livestock uh, production because what we believe is that we need a change in our diets towards a more plant-based diet, and that's why you see uh, this type of numbers. Um, in terms of new creation, you have in the blue graphic at the left, left hand side, uh, where are the new jobs that could be created? You have Brazil, Mexico, and some others. So you see that this is positive for employment, this is positive for environment. So we, uh, we, we need uh, to take that into account to put in place policies, okay? Uh, what's the problem? That informality, uh, it's, a, it's, it's something important in most of the sectors that I have mentioned. So, as I said before, informality is at the, at, the, at the center of this idea of just transition. Please, next slide. Why is that? In Latin America, one out of every two jobs are informal in Latin America and the Caribbean. So if you have a job, you have very uh, many possibilities to, to, to be working in the informal economy. Uh, so, and that's a problem because there are many things that are not possible to do it, as I was mentioned before. For example, if those, uh, those sectors, they, they are part of the informal economy, they are not organized and they, are, uh, they can't participate in social dialogue processes, they don't have access to uh, social protection systems, they are, have very little access to capacity building uh, projects. So this idea of the transition, it will be difficult for them to take part of the process. Okay, um, well, next slide, please. And then we have a very important uh, focus on gender. Uh, we wanted to understand in this uh, report that I mentioned that we did together with the, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, we wanted to understand what was the, the gender implication of that. And we found out something that was very impressive. 80% uh, of the new jobs, of these 15 new jobs that could be created, will go to men, will, will access uh, for men workers. And only 20% of the new 15 jobs that will be created out of the decarbonization path in the region will be uh, benefiting uh, women. So we see that this idea of a green recovery, a green economy, may have a very uh, important and very significant implication on, on terms of gender inequality in the, in, the, in, the, in the future in the region. And why is that? Because most of the jobs that are part of what we call just transition sectors, construction, to transport, energy, agriculture, uh, manufacturing, industry, men are the ones that have, that have them. So do, you have here the numbers, uh, 56 million uh, of those just transition workers are men in comparison uh, with the 22 million uh, workers that are women. So if we do a business as usual scenario, we'll see, we understand well why this is, uh, we have this situation of 80% going for men and 20% going for women. And what we need, we need to put in place a very, very ambitious uh, women, women equity, well, gender equality and gender equity uh, policies. Please, next. So how is the region in terms of uh, just transition? There are many countries who have already started to work on that. We have Costa Rica, 
one of the pillars of the, uh, the decarbonization plan is based effectively on just transition and, and the labor transition. In Mexico City, which is the image you have at the right hand side, they have their own uh, green jobs program. They started last year, last year and, and, and keep working on that in, in Colombia. Last year as well, uh, the Ministry of Labor uh, signed uh, an agreement uh, with a pact, a Green Jobs and Just Transition Pact with the ILO, and we are working together in the implementation of that pact. Argentina, they are uh, discussing about green economy, and right now they are uh, discussing in a tripartite uh, manner how uh, this idea of just transition and green jobs could be part of the COVID recovery uh, path. Uh, Guyana as well, which is Guyana is it's a, it's a very special country because of the discovery of oil they had uh, a few a few months ago, and then you also have Chile, for example, where they have already launched the just transition strategy, which is very linked to the coal phase out of the electricity mix. So there are some other things that I have not mentioned, and, and that are already going on. So it's important uh, to understand that just transition is there, it's at the policy level, etc. Very little, however, on informality, and very little, very little on gender equity. So there are areas of work which is very important because it, we need them, but very little on the areas that I mentioned before. Next slide, please. Okay, how to address that? Okay. I, I was I, I was already talking about that farming. Those are only three examples from farming, transport, energy, and sustainable tourism. We we need to have very uh, ambitious uh, objectives to stop deforestation, to promote integration of small and big producers, changing diets, etc. But we have to pay attention to the type of work that those uh, that this sector uh, create low salaries lack of social protection very long working hours and the need to improve occupational uh, safety and health measures because right now in these sectors are very low transport and energy we need of course to work on this decarbonization of the electricity generation but uh, especially in the transport sector we have to pay attention to this idea of employment formalization because 50% uh, of the employment in the transport sector is in, is informal right now in, in the region so we need of course social dialogue but how we need to make sure that this part of the informal sector is part of the dialogue uh, if you, you talk about sustainable tourism, um, it, it's, it's, um, I, have here the, I have here the numbers, 55% of, the, of the, all workers uh, active in these sectors are working in the informal economy. More than half of workers work in the informal economy. So what, what means for them? We have a climate shock. We have something related to, to a hurricane or, or floods, something like that. And simply this type of workers don't have any access to anything. They don't go to work next day and that's it. They don't have access to social protection, to pensions, to any other thing. And there is a, a very interesting area of work where we can uh, work together on reducing, on make this uh, sector more eco, more environmentally sustainable, reducing waste, use clean energy, uh, producing eco and local food. And that will create, of course, of course uh, local, local jobs, which are very much needed right, right now after COVID. Next slide, and I think it's the last one. Those are the ideas that we believe could be, I mean, make, make sense in order to have this green and fair recovery, particularly uh, after uh, COVID-19. Uh, first of all, of course, supporting formalization of business and workers, uh, facilitating the access of workers to social protection, in particular in the sector that are very relevant to just transition, agro-construction, waste and energy. Green jobs creation programs, uh, for example, in, in the form of public employment programs to protect or restore environment reforestation programs, maritime ecosystem programs. Uh, why those are interesting? Not only because we create uh, uh, temporal jobs, uh, but also because we provide the skills and, and incomes. And we can include vulnerable sectors like migrant communities. Uh, the third element is improve uh, health and uh, safety and health at work. 
um, and a company formalization program, in, again, in those sectors that are important because of their environmental content. Next, the social dialogue for workers and communities, but we need to take into account that social dialogue is not possible if there is not uh, a formalization of the sector because they, they need to get formalized in, in, in one way or the other, cooperative or some other way, in order to get a vote. Okay? And the, next, the last one is for Latin America. This is very important because there, there has been very little attention paid to that. Industrial development linked to clean sectors, renewable energies, uh, vehicle, um, clean vehicles, uh, industrial sectors related to circular economy, industrial eco parks, waste, energy, water efficiency, and everything related to sustainable uh, mobility. So if we put in place all these type of uh, approaches, policy approaches and, and, and this type of concept, it will be, I mean, that, that will enable a just transition to happen in the region. And, and uh, yeah, thank, thanks, this is my, my last, uh, last slide and my, and my message uh, to the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was such a, a important perspectives and I think uh, we've gone a little bit long. So what I'm going to do is I'd like to turn to Professor Clancy to talk about uh, some of the gender dimensions in in her work. Uh, what I what I will come back to you on, though, and as you, you mentioned a number of times, um, uh, formalization of the sectors. And I think for many of us, you know, how how you actually go about doing that. What are the strategies for doing that? How successful have we been in other places? So when we come back to the question and answer session, I'd love to start with you on that question. Um, but let's turn over to, to uh, Joy to get us started on uh, women in the just energy transition. Thank you, Sarah. And also thank you, Anna. I enjoyed what you had to say very much. And I think what a lot of what you said actually resonates with the findings that um, in the energy, gender and energy research program, we did, uh, we focused on the informal street food sector. And I recognize a lot of what you were saying in, in, uh, in, in our work. Um, and I would also you know, emphasize that it's the informal sector exists, uh, is a global issue. It's not just uh, an issue that relates to, to, to developing countries. So, um, and so a lot of what I'm going to say is also comes from that learning that we have, we found in, in that particular research program. Um, it, it may sort of be stated in the obvious that uh, energy transforms women's and men's lives, but it doesn't always behave in the way that we, we would we expect. Um, what we find uh, is that, um, you know, it's, Technology makes our lives easier, but it doesn't always uh, do other things that we would like. It's for, for example, it doesn't save, necessarily save time. And that's something that we find from, uh, from actually work in uh, research in the US, which shows that um, women spend more time doing domestic chores uh, because they do, they do them more often. We have, our standards also change. So um, we have to be a bit careful about what assumptions we make and check that our findings actually do, do occur. Um, women and men have different energy needs and that depends on the roles that they have both inside and outside the, the home and so that is, means that things vary are going to vary with communities and in context and uh, I heard uh, Ben mention about context and I think that's one of the things in our research program we found where we had um, at least 12 countries and how even say within the informal street food sector in sub-Saharan Africa in three countries how the situation was very different and that's often uh, or is in part is linked to the, co uh, the context the institutional context in which you uh, are, are working. For example, in Rwanda, the informal sector does not exist. The government has very strict policies on, on that. So again, you've, you've got to see the, the context in which you, uh, you are working. And even within the same country, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's in the US context, of course, it's such a huge country, but it, it, that's rather stating the obvious that there are very different communities spread throughout the country. But even in a smaller country, like the Netherlands, where my university is based, there are these very big differences between the east of the country, the west of the country, the north and the south. So context matters. 
Now, what we find generally, and I think this is something Anna also touched on, is that women are generally, but not always, and that's something I want to stress as well, is not always are they in a worse social, economic and political positions that men, uh, than men. We use the terms women and men, but they are not two homogeneous categories. They vary across a range of characteristics. And what, um, there is a tendency for data to present it um, as male and female headed households. And if you look at the, uh, the data, some of the data the World Bank has collected, that in some countries you'll find that women headed households have better electricity access than, uh, uh, than male headed households. Now, that's not what intuitively we are led to believe. We always we believe that women are in a worse position than, than, uh, than men. So there's, there's a lot more complicated things going on. And so you need to look at those in a much more careful uh, and detailed uh, way. And one of the other things in terms of just transitions, if we're thinking about the green economy and um, renewable energy is opening up opportunities, one of the other things that you see argued is that um, women working, it's, it's, it uh, improves their position. In our position in what sense? Well, certainly economically it can improve their position, but it, there is a tendency to think that their lives in general, that they're, they're empowered, immediately comes from, from having a job. That's, our evidence shows that that doesn't necessarily ring true, that you need more than economic empowerment to be, have a much greater sense of empowerment for control over your own, own life. Um, now, the, the energy sector, though, does enable women, that opens up new opportunities for, for women and for men. And, and uh, Anna gave us some details uh, on, on that in the context of Latin America. But it also improves the, the possibility not only to have an energy business, but the way that you use energy within your business. And what our informal food sector uh, work showed that how having access to electricity opened up the number of products that you could offer, even from the, from the roadside. So there's a lot of opportunity I see here uh, uh, coming. Next Next slide, please. All right, so um, what, do, what do we think needs to change? Well, lots of things. I mean, uh, Ben's put a, a limit on the, the, the time, uh, but I just want to make a few things that we've uh, that we found. Some of this also comes from the work that um, my co-author and I, who, uh, Mariella Feinstra, we've done also some work on uh, what is happening in Europe in terms of energy access and, and uh, energy poverty. So some of this work also comes from um, uh, some of the things I'm going to say also comes from that work. I mean, I think, well, it's rather stating the obvious that um, increasing women's involvement as decision makers in the energy, in energy policy is something that is needed. You can argue this, as, as Ben was saying about the just transition, you can argue it from very different perspectives. But one thing I would caution again is about the numbers game. Having 50-50 uh, percentage of women and men on a committee is not necessarily going to bring uh, either a just energy transition or a greater influence of women. It depends on context. And also there is a, what you tend to find is that if you get a woman on a committee, she's a person put in charge of gender. It becomes women's responsibility. It isn't. It's a joint responsibility. It's something that men, men as well as women have to be responsible for. And there are many men who are doing that. And that's good to, good to see that you need male champions as well as female, female champions. You need a strong institutional framework for um, the gender energy nexus to be a just transition. And here it's not only institutions in the energy sector, but also a much broader set of institutions. Take banks, for, for example. What we found in our informal sector work is the attitudes of banks to go to lending women's informal sector businesses was very different to, to male businesses. Women are, you know, it's, it's, it's just pin money. It's money for, you know, small things. It's not, in, not so important. They're not seen as key business people by banks. So those are the sorts of attitudes that we need to, uh, to change. Yes, of course, we need more women in STEM. 
that's uh, that's true again from many different different uh, perspectives. But what our uh, research, the you know review of the literature found, this is not our particular uh, work, but it's influencing mothers of daughters at a very early age, before you get them into school even, that if, uh, the mother's attitude to girls doing science is, is key to getting more girls interested in, in science. Um, but it's never too late that you can still influence even as you go uh, higher, uh, you know, go, go through uh, the age groups. Harvard, for example, has had a very good uh, program on in including older girls into coming into, into science. So it's never, never uh, too late. It's also about acknowledging uh, that there is a gender gap in, in energy uh, poverty. Going back to what I was saying about it's not just men and uh, women as two homogeneous groups, what we found certainly in the context of, of uh, Europe is that the older you are, then the more likely you are to live in energy poverty. And this, is, this becomes even more so for women due to things that happen earlier in their life cycle, that they often earn less, so they have lower, uh, lower pensions, and that makes it difficult for them to pay energy bills. So it's, so it's about changing your perceptions. I mentioned the one about women's uh, informal sector businesses not being serious businesses. So there's lots of things that need to change. So next, next slide, please. Um, I think that the, that the energy transition and the gender transition of going towards equality for, uh, for gender equality is, is a get, is it, there is no question of that, that I, we see three areas in particular where this is opening up opportunities, that um, in terms of the energy sources of moving from fossils to renewables does open up that discussion of decentralization and decentralization brings you much closer to citizens. And then, as uh, you know, Ben said, uh, all there was to say uh, on that, uh, that issue uh, earlier. Also, policy is now looking much more at demand supply yes you've got to have an energy supply but if by looking at demand you get much closer to the to gender issues of who is uh, responsible for for what um, and in terms of governance, also going towards facilitation. Again, we had uh, what uh, the CSIS uh, program is doing. I think that there's lots of exciting um, projects going on, on around uh, the world on how to engage with citizens, how to engage now and then, then citizen is a very gener generalized term. Citizens are not a homogeneous group. They come in all forms, shapes, sizes, and they need, they need to find how to engage with them. But I see that if uh, the energy transition of doing this also helps uh, gender transition. And now onto my final slide. Oh no, sorry, I've got two more. Um, well, what can we do? Um, I was asked to give you some tips. Well, I chose three. There are, um, there are, there's a lot more. There's a lot more uh, out there, and if you go onto the Energy uh, website, then you'll find lots of tools uh, there. But I would say that if you take a gender approach in data collection and analysis, that's going to open up a lot of uh, things for you. Without data, there's no visibility. No visibility, there's no interest. And you, you, you get good data by asking the right questions to the right people by the right people. And so you have to again understand your community. If it's a community where it's not done for um, a, a male, uh, male uh, interviewer who's not a family member, then you cannot send them to, uh, to that particular community. But you do see this even in organizations who I think should know, uh, should know uh, better. And it's, it's, um, it's no good asking, uh, uh, you have to make sure that you're, if you're going to ask questions about cooking, you ask the person in the household who is responsible for, 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 for that. I would also avoid generic names like communities and uh, citizens because that, that, that hides a lot of the people who you want to get, uh, get involved. Now, one of the tools that Energia has used is a tool called Gender Audits. Some of you who are aware of gender uh, issues may know about a, 
um, something called gender budgets. Gender budgets is looking at government or, or a major institutions' finances and how they spend those finances, and are they done in a very in a, a very uh, gendered way? It requires a really detailed, uh, good understanding of um, how governments' budgets w work and formulate and that it's highly specialized. So this was seen as rather elitist and not very inclusive of enabling um, a much greater number of people to have uh, to be involved in, uh, in policy formulation and implementation. So um, gender audits is a much more uh, wider way of analyzing policy to check on how gender aware it is. So it, this, these processes raise awareness, they can help hold policymakers to account and they can change policy and there is uh, there's a, a you'll find a paper on the energy website which which will give you some more details on 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 this and another another one is is organizational assessment how gender aware and how uh, diverse is your organization. There's, there's plenty of research now to show that diverse organizations in terms of the, the social characteristics of the, their employees are much stronger organizations. They perform better. Um, and so I think that this is, um, it's, so it's not only, it's about your employment policy, but also about the way of doing your, your uh, business. And I use business in a very gen generalized uh, way they're not necessarily in profit making. Okay, some policy recommendations. I've mentioned about uh, collecting sex disaggregated data, which should be presented intersectionally to, to show variations in, uh, in communities and identities in terms of ethnicity, in terms of uh, economic status, class, whole ranges, and that show, begins to show that there are different people who need different support in different types of, uh, of ways. Um, having um, engendered energy poverty indicators or indicators in, in general related to, to energy. Also recognizing that energy is both multidisciplinary and cross-sectoral that uh, the health sector uses energy a lot. I was talking to uh, a friend who is a microbiologist. He had um, to help in Sierra Leone set up a laboratory so that they could do monitoring of Ebola. And he said, I got this great laboratory, wasn't any problem to get the money for to fund it, no electricity supply to run it. So that, so that there is this cross-sectional uh, um, need as, uh, as well. And I would also say that if you're talking to the energy sector, I, it, it's better to talk to, to them about how empowering vulnerable households create potential for upscaling the energy transition. It's better for business. Gender uh, equality will come as as a consequence of that. If you talk to them about this is good for gender equality, well, they will go, yes, okay, yeah, fine, don't have a problem with that. But how is that good for my business? Gender equality is also good for business. And that's, uh, that is, uh, that's my last comment. So thank you everybody for listening and I'm happy to respond to any questions and comments. And thank you for C to CSIS for asking me to be involved. No, excellent. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, uh, we're very happy to have you involved. Um, so we have uh, just a few minutes for questions, but I do want to get to a couple. Anna, uh, I do want to ask you that question about, uh, on a very practical level, how do you go about uh, uh, formalizing informal sectors? Uh, and is that necessarily the first step to getting social dialogue and the, and, uh, the type of uh, of, of things that we need to, to sort of formalize sectors and then, you know, get them included in these just transitions conversations. And if you can be brief, I'll be able to get in more questions. We've had a number from the audience. So I'll, I'll ask you both that. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Oh, I mean, formalization is one of the steps that we need to put in place in order to, to be able to create green jobs and have a, a just transition. It is an important one because it deals with a very wide range of sectors uh, of economic sectors that are important for uh, for this idea of transforming the economy and making drastic changes and all these that we need towards a more sustainable uh, 
kind of green economy, but it's not the only one uh, for sure. Uh, we need many other things. We need, uh, for example, training. We have seen that there is a very important uh, um, training, learning uh, gap in order, I mean, to, to be able to, to do things in a, in a correct way, to do uh, buildings that are efficient and use clean energy and, and, and uh, recycling the, the, the water. We also need new, like, new understanding about how we can really use the material that we, we have in, in the economy and all this. So informality is one of them, but there are some many others. And in, in relation to, um, to social dialogue and how can we work on that, uh, of course, we can find a way of having the voice of the informal economy on the board, but we need to find that way. So how we are going to work with them. And I agree very much with what our last speaker said about trying to avoid uh, names such as community or citizens, because we, we need to understand who is in front of you in the table where you are negotiating a new plan or a new policy or a new budget or, or something new. Uh, so we need to, to make sure that we have organized uh, sectors, workers or companies. So we need employers associations, employers organizations, and very strong ones. And for example, they are not strong enough in the green kind of environmental sectors. Same thing with uh, trade unions or employers. We need to be, uh, we need them to be stronger in, in this sector that we have mentioned, like clean energy or, or, or construction or the waste or recycling or eco food production and, and organic agriculture and things like that. So we will find a way of having the, I was saying that we, we will find a way of, of making sure that social dialogue works even if uh, we don't have very strong uh, for formalized workers, or formalized companies in those sectors that I was mentioning. But we need to find that way and we need to put in place uh, actions or initiatives to make sure that those workers are, are well represented and, are, and, and have the opportunity to discuss. We are doing something like that, by the way, in some countries in the region uh, with the new indices, so the climate action uh, policies that countries are developing, we, we are trying to, to bridge that, uh, to meet that bridge, I mean, to bridge that gap, sorry, uh, and to make sure that those workers are placed, I mean, have a seat in the table, uh, in the negotiation table as well. Um, that's Great. It. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, good job picking up right where you left off. <laughs> <laughs> which is not always easy to do. Um, Joy, if you can hear us and if you're ready, I think, you know, one of the things I wanted to pick up on, and I think we'll make this the last question for this session and, and maybe we'll try and, and um, get back to some of the ones that we've received from the audience uh, a, a little bit later or follow up on them somehow. Um, but you had mentioned uh, sort of the, the, uh, the, the route to, uh, uh, empowering vulnerable communities as being a way to sort of more durably engender uh, sort of gender dimensions in a just transition. And I think that that's a really innovative and interesting approach. But could you talk in a greater level of specificity about how you do that, right? So what, what does that actually look like in practice? And, and why is that your recommended strategy for thinking about um, uh, solving some of these these gender dimensions. I was going to ask you a data question, but I, I think that that would take a, a much longer um, uh, conversation. So I thought maybe we could start with this. Joy, if you can hear me. Okay, I suspect Joy isn't able to hear right now. So um, what we'll do is we'll try and come back to Joy towards the end if we've got some uh, if we've got some time. Um, but I do want to say, you know, thank you to Anna and Joy, and uh, we'll be putting some of the resources that they talked about uh, on the web uh, uh, for, for you to access, because I think there's a lot more for all of us practitioners in this space to be digging into. Um, so why don't we move uh, to the second panel? And as I said, we'll try to go back and, and uh, maybe ask some questions if there's time at the end uh, along the lines of, of what people had posted in the chat uh, for this. Um, so. So the second dimension here, no less complex than the first, is uh, is the issue of uh, of place-based investment. And here we wanted to explore place place-based investment strategies, regional development strategies, and the role that they're playing uh, for different communities in thinking about 
uh, 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 moving forward with the just transition, particularly how investors or multilateral development banks are thinking along the lines of place-based investment strategies and regional development and the role that they play in just transitions. And here too, we've got a wonderful uh, uh, a group of folks who are in involved in this conversation. Uh, first, we've got uh, Barbara Rambusek, uh, who is going to be uh, assisted by her colleague, Margarita Calderon. Um, Barbara is the Director of Gender and Economic Inclusion at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, uh, Barbara is, uh, has got a cold, and so we're going to uh, help her power through uh, being able to, to talk and present, and we know how hard that is to do. So, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, next, we're going to have Uber Strauss, who is the lead economist for the European Investment Bank, talk about uh, what EIB is doing. Um, it's been really exciting, quite frankly, to watch EBRD and EIB and Europe uh, as they're sort of pioneering a lot of these uh, techniques and, and strategies, and, and we have a lot to learn uh, from them. And then finally, uh, Carolina Herrera, from, uh, from, who's the manager for green finance and climate action in the Latin America project for Natural Resources Defense Council. So again, we're short on time, so we'll try and keep these presentations uh, tight so we can get to as many questions uh, as we can. And then and hopefully we might be able to circle back and, and hear from Joy as well. So uh, Barbara, why don't you get us started? Thank you very much. And um, apologies for my very croaky voice um, today, but I will try and speak as much as I can. I will be supported by Margarita Calderona, who's in my team and who actually leads a lot of the practical action on the ground in relation to just transition ahead and brings a wealth of knowledge in this context as well. As we have heard already from uh, the, the two speakers before us, um, uh, the green transition uh, creates many opportunities, but a lot of challenges. And the, the big challenge that we all face, I think, if we want to make that green transition sustainable, is that we also bring along with us um, everybody. We need to make sure that nobody's left behind, that communities, countries, um, but also individuals, people, um, different groups of people uh, are not negatively affected and where potential negative impacts could happen, that those are mitigated and are addressed effectively. At EBRD, uh, we have a, a mandate to focus on investing primarily in the private sector in order to ensure that our countries of operations become sustainable market economies. What we mean by that is that they have um, fulfilled certain criteria that become um, competitive, but also very importantly, uh, two criteria that they, they, they become green economies and also inclusive economies. And it's that nexus between those two strategic priorities that EBRD brings that really lies at the heart of what we do in relation to just transition. Uh, we have um, uh, some experience now on our Just Transition initiative. Um, we have started uh, to do that uh, in, over the past um, two years. Uh, we have a few projects that, there now, um, but overall in relation to um, um, particularly the green and the inclusive um, um, strategic focus, we bring three decades of, of experience um, and have large programs that are well established and, and uh, bringing those two together now is, is, is a very um, exciting process and one that we really feel can actually make a difference. If we look at green, um, we have invested over 33 billion euros already um, at the moment, 56% of our investments uh, go into green investments. That will go up to 50% um, as of next year. So uh, we really um, have a huge and very ambitious agenda when it comes to green investments. Um, some um, flagship programs such as the Green Cities programs, um, where we work with, N, uh, with uh, local authorities, um, both on investments, but also policy making. But of course, also uh, working very uh, much with the private sector, particularly in hard to abate sectors. Uh, to invest uh, in, in green technologies and finally supporting SMEs. On the inclusive side, our approach is, is grounded on the focus on inequality of opportunity. So we look at factors that inhibit equality of opportunity that lie outside of a person's direct control. So that is gender, that is socioeconomic environment. It is also a pl place of birth. Um, and all these factors um, we look at when we actually make our investments, um, which at the moment have reached about um, 10.5 billion um, over the past uh, few, well, five, six, seven years. In, in well over 200 projects. So we focus on, on, on women and youth underdeveloped regions, migrants and others. We have actually built up a, a lot of expertise in this context um, in relation to looking at our clients actually as employers 
and creating access to jobs and skills, but also working through intermediaries um, to en enhance access to finance, for example, for young, uh, for young people, for women, but also for less developed regions, and then also in relation to providing access to services um, from infrastructure to ICT connectivity. So um, upskilling, reskilling, and, and related policy initiative, particularly also at the regional level, um, looking at, at skills needs, addressing those um, in an inclusive way, and also supporting um, SMEs and entrepreneurship uh, is something that really lies at the heart of, of what we do. In the past few years, and also with the um, partnership of the Climate Investment Fund, we have expanded what we do in this context, uh, specifically looking at the nexus between gender and green um, and scaling up our activities in this context and um, very much along the lines of some of the things we've heard earlier in the previous presentations. Um, the next slide will be done by my colleague, um, um, Margarita. Uh, yes, so we have created a series of practically oriented guidelines based on uh, EBRD experience as a transition bank, but also on historical experiences. So the first point is really linked to what Mafalda said at the start, the importance of, of ownership. And uh, we don't need to delay this process, even though we might not have all the answers right now, because using lead time effectively is really crucial to build consensus around actions and overcome resistance, build capacities, and of course, create local ownership. Also, uh, with uh, place-based uh, strategies, uh, planning should be holistic, should take into account pre-existing inequalities, it should address the multifaceted dimensions of, of uh, regional uh, development policies, and it should also be integrated within the broader national policies, international policies, or EU policies for certain EU countries. There is a strong need for uh, able institutions and capacity building efforts at the local level to support sustainable and inclusive policy design and, and, and investments and, and the long term strategies and planning. Uh, of course, there is a clear role for the state on this, but the role of the private sector can also be transformative. Um, and also the, the, the important point is, of course, that the carbonizations must be encouraged across different sectors, as uh, we don't want to use uh, these as a, a solution for further lock-in, uh, as this would just create uh, new losers. And, uh, of course, environmental legacies must be addressed as well. In supporting workers, it is uh, crucial to think about those both directly and indirectly impacted, as we have uh, seen in the previous presentations, and particularly about disadvantaged uh, groups, and, and, um, such as women, but also young people, older workers. And the support uh, should, be, should come in, in packages uh, with uh, offering new jobs, uh, as well as reskilling and upskilling opportunities, employment services, career counseling, access to financial resources. And this should be well tied to the needs of the local labor markets. Uh, and, and to support this, there should also be economic diversification strategies tailored to the specificities of the affected community. And also considering that in some cases, there might be a need for a managed retreat. Um, the next slide, please. And based on these experiences, we defined our three priority themes for the Just Transition, which are around the, the green economy transition, supporting workers, and the regional economic diversification. On uh, the green economy, uh, we want to work with our clients, uh, both at the, in terms of employers and policymakers, with uh, high carbon that hold high carbon assets in the transition to a low carbon economy. This might include the reconversion of certain assets, along with the work, uh, along with re uh, remediation, rehabilitation of land, but also supporting the workers that are linked to certain assets and uh, a series of other green investments that might create access to local employment. 
in supporting workers, there is a need to uh, promote access and an inclusive access to alternative job opportunities for those whose livelihoods are affected by the transition. And this can be done through uh, tailored reskilling and upskilling programs in the context of addressing the existing inequalities, as I said before. In terms of regional diversification, there is a need to emphasize activities that uh, support uh, competitive small and big businesses and uh, finance projects, uh, larger projects as well in sustainable infrastructure, uh, where this can be uh, hopefully green and provide also access to jobs. As such, the, the, the bank will uh, proactively identify investments and policy activities that can accelerate uh, impact across these three themes. And we also have a series of impact objectives linked and, and, uh, and matched to these with relevant indicators and specific benchmarks that reflect the ambition. And these will be monitored throughout the project lifeline. About one minute left. Okay, thank uh, you yes. very much. If, if we go quickly to the next slide then, please. Um, so this is just an illustration in terms of the theory of change. So I mentioned those um, um, two big uh, uh, strategic areas that we have, our focus on green, our focus on inclusive. As part of how we measure impact and how we design projects, um, we are developing theories of change for all these um, 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 themes. Um, this here is an example of the inclusive theme that we are developing. And uh, going forward, what we will do is um, embed our Just Transition initiative and the activities, the investments and the policy engagement that we do un underneath that in, in that theory of change approach um, and to really chart the, the, the progress of, of uh, in, and the impact that we achieve from, from the inputs to the outputs and, and the outcomes um, and then the country level impact um, across those lines. If we go to the next slide. So um, we very quickly wanted to give you an example of um, uh, what we actually do in relation to just transition in a regional context. I'm focusing on the Western Balkans. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have a wealth of experience yet, but we do have um, some programs um, in the Western Balkans where we, but we, we focus on evidence-based interventions and policy engagement, and that is done through a just transition diagnostic. So first we look at um, uh, um, a vulnerability screening and a regional assessment to really identify the vulnerable sectors, how they will be affected, who will be affected, the groups, what are the potentials for investments, um, but also what is the impact um, on workers and, and on the regional um, economic development opportunities. Um, are there any plans that exist? Um, who are the governance stakeholders and, and what, what mechanisms may already exist? On that basis, we then develop um, together with partners also a just transition action plan that has a clear set of policy and investment activities, but also an action plan to look at who does what, where does the funding come from, um, where does the interaction come from. On the basis of that, we then design our model. We have a range of different um, tools that we can mobilize from investments to technical assistance policy dialogue and of course um, targeted concessionality. But the importance is that this is actually embedded and done in cooperation and in alignment with the other stakeholders, the public, the private sector, um, um, the local stakeholder, the national stakeholder involvements, and then other MDBs and IFIs. We also have strong partnerships with the World Bank, with the EU, with the European Training Foundation, for example, in, in the Western Balkans, but also the ILO in this context. They all play a very, very important part at a regional level. Um, and and it's, it's about, uh, the importance is to find uh, the specific um, contribution that we can make in this context. If we go to the next slide. Um, the COVID crisis had, has hit us all um, and in a way on top of the challenges that we already faced before the crisis hit. Um, there are now additional challenges because of course the pandemic has changed um, inequality uh, challenges has changed the, the, the focus on green. And so if we want, want to actually build back better, we need to understand 
what these changes mean, what the pandemic has actually done. So um, we are working very closely to better understand the impact on women. Um, and, and there is increasingly uh, more and more evidence that, for example, women um, um, hold 39% of, of global employment, but actually face 54% of job losses as a direct result of the pandemic. So they are much more affected by the pandemic. Young people's um, education has been interrupted. For aging uh, workers, it's much harder to stay within the workforce or to transit into other sectors. And of course, regions, particularly those that have been looking, for example, as tourism, um, as one of the areas to diversify into away from polluting um, um, in industries and sectors into other sources of, 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 of economic of an economic basis may find that these opportunities simply do not exist anymore. Um, and at the same time, of course, the focus on, on green investments, the appetite for green investments um, by investors is, is lower. And also by policymakers, um, sometimes the hard choices that need to be made and the hard, the tough decisions are harder to make in an environment where, the crisis, where a crisis is already there. If we go to the next slide. So um, just to finish off um, very briefly, um, we wanted to give you an example of just transition in, in one uh, of, of our countries of operation. We have an investment in Poland in one of the uh, coal regions where we, we invest in an energy provider. Um, but the challenge there really is, is um, that uh, this investment and the transition away from coal affects um, a few thousand workers um, that are directly impacted by that and only uh, relatively few will be able to go into early retirement. So we have been working with our client to look at um, the inequality implications directly, also in relation to skills and profiles and gaps, uh, to look at uh, the opportunities for reskilling um, and um, the uh, high quality certified training opportunities, internal deployment, but also very importantly, engaging with the external job market, looking at external job transfers in partnership with local education providers and the job centers, with a specific focus on, on women in the workplace um, for all the reasons that, that we have also discussed earlier on. So very importantly, though, um, all these activities are embedded within a wider regional focus, engaging the, the local um, stakeholders, such as development agencies, the, the uh, trade unions, sectoral associations, at national level, ministries for energy, um, treasury, and then also the EU, to make sure that these activities and, and the actions that we, we set with our client actually make part uh, make make sense and, and contribute, um, form part of a, a wider regional economic development strategy. And then the actual green investment um, that, that came on top of that, that in a way uh, triggered these, these um, engagements. So I, I leave it at that, but I'm very happy to answer any questions. And thank you to Margarita also for stepping in. Thank you very much, Barbara and Margarita, for that. And I'm sorry to rush everybody. I just want to make sure we get uh, we get everybody's presentations in on time. Um, always such a, a wealth of, uh, of of activity going on at EBRD. We've had you present on some of these case studies in previous uh, se sessions. So really glad to have that information again. Uh, Uber, I want to switch to you now, uh, talking about the work of the EIB and thinking about the just transition mechanism and, and all the ways you're in trying to incorporate these ideas into some of your investment plans. So if, if you wouldn't mind, we'll give you about 10 minutes and uh, I'll start going like this if you <laughs> if you get close to the time. Thanks, Uber. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm afraid you will have to. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and uh, thanks to Barbara and, uh, and her colleague Margarita for a fascinating um, presentation on the EBRD work on just transition. Uh, to make the transition uh, between two presentations, let me say that EBRD is uh, doing good work on just transition and we are actually working together because the EBRD has also carried out a consultancy study at the moment on uh, the understanding on just transition that involves all the larger institutions, the multinational development banks and we are very happy to provide comments to, to this excellent work that is coming out of this and we are working closely together on, on that topic. Now if you let uh, put the next slide please to get me started. Here at DIB we are, uh, we are very close to EU policies as always. The European Commission has committed to mobilize at least one trillion of investment in the next decade to support a just and green transition. Within that, the EIB contribution will, is expected to amount to around 250 billion in terms of mobilized investment under various EU mandates, that is EU instruments and through the EU budget. Uh, 
In addition, the IAB is on its way to dedicate 50% of our lending to climate and environment by 2025. This compares with today's 25% target for climate only. The new 50% target implies a total of 1 trillion in investments for climate and environment over the coming decade, which includes the IB own financing operations as well as those I just mentioned under EU man mandates. Um, important to add that the other 50% of our lending will need to live up to the do no harm principle, which is being specified in legislation and will be um, determined in the near future. Moreover, the IB has committed to reach full alignment with the Paris Agreement by the end of 2020. So this is the scene setter for the green transition. The transition to a climate neutral EU economy by 2050 will however entail a profound social and economic challenge for regions that today still depend heavily on carbon intensive industries and mining. There's a risk of significant job losses, lower regional GDP and lower tax revenues. Many of these areas that are most affected are already today places left behind that deal with stranded assets, shrinking towns and communities and growing inequalities. Without due attention to the economic and social needs of these territories, the political consensus on decarbonization could dwindle um, and uh, the ownership uh, could get lost and the decarbonization could get uh, delayed. In fact, for most, uh, wait, wait a minute, for most uh, of the affected communities, the transition ahead in place implies entering uncharted territories. While they will have to make radical changes to their energy mix and huge investments into the energy efficiency of buildings and production modes, the most affected regions will only meet their labor reallocation challenge if they manage to retrain and upskill their workforce and manage to attract new economic activities with a view to limiting massive emigration of young people. The Joint Research Center of the European Commission estimates that some 450,000 jobs in the EU directly or indirectly depend on coal mining and coal-fired electricity generation. These jobs are concentrated on only 20 out of the 240 EU regions. So the good news in this is that the other regions have already got out of coal mining and coal-fired power production. But um, it also shows the attention that we need to devote to these 20 regions. So next slide, please. The next, the complete overhaul of economic development path facing the most affected regions can only be successful with a very broad strategy. Indeed, just transition entails multiple transition to ensure a balanced, integrated territorial development and an economic future for the most coal and heavy industry dependent territories. The transition will have several dimensions and this resembles very much the three just transition priority themes that the EBRD just presented with the only difference perhaps that we split the green economy transition in, into an energy transition and an environmental transition, which would entail all the, the site regeneration efforts, the afforestation efforts and the cleaning efforts that are needed to allow to enable future economic development for new sectors. So this is why we can now move on to the next uh, slide, please. So as this suggest, suggests that to meet the just transition challenge, a one size fits all policy will not do it, do the trick, but it will take a broad multi-sector and place specific strategy. Um, here also we are very much aligned on, on what the EBRD thinks. I think it's just a truism. A strategy that addresses the specific economic, social and environmental challenges in vulnerable communities. The tremendous reallocation of labor and land to new uses requires good spatial planning and a just transition master plan that coordinates the sectoral needs under a sound governance structure and makes sure that all con stakeholders concerned are around the table and have a say and can help to plan their own future. Regions need to be aware of their specific strengths that decades of industrial activity have allowed building up but can be put to new uses. For example, 
Many companies in the German Ruhr area are nowadays exporters of environmental technology solutions. Another example, take the UN University in Maastricht in the, in the Netherlands, which was created 50 years ago in response to the country's decision to phase out coal mining in, in the Limburg region. Nowadays, it's one of the best universities in the Netherlands. Other aspects and experiences of historic transitions have been more mixed and should also be incorporated in today's strategy making to avoid repeating others' mistakes in the past. The EIB has a long track record in supporting just transition projects. For example, in the form of large-scale environmental rehabilitation projects in Germany, for example, the Lusatia Brownfields rehabilitation or the Emscher River renaturation and industrial diversification. Then we do multi-sector framework loans to foster regional development projects, for example, economic diversification in Brandenburg or regional infrastructure in Moravskos Lesko in the Czech Republic and in Castilla y Leon in Spain. Or urban renewal uh, projects in several towns in Silesia in Poland. Here our work with the Polish municipality of Katowice over the past 20 years is a good example. More than 205 million, loan, uh, million euros in loans contributed to Katowice's successful transition from a stagnating coal mining town to a vibrant urban center, offering new businesses or business opportunities and a healthier environment for its, its citizens. Now let us look ahead. Next slide, please. As I said, we are closely aligned with EU policies. We are helping the European Commission and the European Union to smoothen the transition and leave no one behind. And for that, the, um, the European Union is setting up the just transition mechanism as an integral part of the Sustainable Europe Investment Plan, which we, we mobilize some 100 billion of investments during the next EU budget planning framework. So to be, to, be, to be clear, the Sustainable Europe Investment Plan as a total is 1 trillion over 10 years. And the just transition mechanism within that plan will mobilize 100 billion in investments over the next seven years. So with contributions from the EU member states, uh, the, the EU budget, the member states, as well as contributions from InvestEU and the EIB and private uh, financiers, of course. All actions under the Just Transition Mechanism must be located in the territories that are most affected by the EU's transition to a low carbon economy or benefit those territories. With territory being a granular concept, uh, referring to administrative levels, not one, but two layers below the nation state, called NUTS three regions in the EU jargon, such as Spanish provinces or French, uh, French departements. While the member states are still in the process of selecting their most affected territories, base, uh, the European Commission has already published a list of 112 such territories based on emissions and sector employment data. Before drawing down the, any EU funds, member states need to present their territorial trust transition plans and get them approved by the European Commission. These plans are like a short version of the operational programs under the EU cohesion policy with a number of requirements such as spelling out the challenges, the investment needs and spelling out the strategy to address these needs and uh, the financing plan. As you can see on this slide, the investment need the, which comes from the, from the European Commission communication on the Sustainable Europe Investment Plan, the just transition mechanism consists of three pillars. On the left-hand side in blue, you see pillar one, which is a grant vehicle supporting investments in the following areas. SMEs, R&D and innovation, energy efficiency, renewable energy, emission reduction, digitalization, decontamination, land restoration, upskilling, retraining workers, and job search. The investment target is still around 40 billion euros, even though the parameters um, of the, this vehicle have changed since the publication of this paper uh, because, of the, in, because of the EU Heads of State Summit in July. There will be 17.5 billion in fresh EU grants, which need to be topped up with at least 11 billion from the EU structural funds. 
This total of 29 billion will be matched by national co-financing obligations of 10 to 15 billion. Like in the EU cohesion policy, the EU grant share is higher the poorer the benefiting region is in terms of GDP per capita. So 85% is, will be the grant share in regions with per capita GDP up to 75% of the EU average, 40% for uh, regions with per capita GDP above the EU average, and 60% for regions in between. Sorry. Just about Pillar one two is the <laughs> yeah. Pillar two is the just transition cross window under Invest EU. Uh, the EU guarantee program for the next programming period that aims at mobilizing 650 billion in private sector investment with higher levels of risk for sustainable infrastructure, SMEs, R&D and social development and skills. While by definition the use of this pillar will be demand driven, the EU's policy target is that 7% of all investment should benefit just transition areas, which would correspond to 45 billion. Pillar three, finally, is the public sector loan facility. It will help unleash 25 billion in investment with the help of 10 billion in EIB loans for projects addressing the serious socio-economic challenges deriving from the transition towards EU's climate targets. The total investment target is 25 billion. As a special trigger for these projects, the EU will provide grants up to 1.5 billion. Each project obtaining an EIB loan under the facility may apply for an investment grant of up to 15 to 20% of the loan amount. Additional financing partners over and above the EIB might come on board if and when the EU obtains permission to generate additional own revenues, for example, from an enlargement of the ETS uh, certificates. Uh, sales. The particular feature of this proposed Pillar 3 regulation is that there is no positive list of eligible sectors, but applicants need to provide sufficient evidence of the geographic eligibility being met and the transition benefits of their project. Across all the three pillars of the Trust Transition Mechanism, EIB advisory services will help to build the project pipeline starting from the Territorial Trust Transition Plans. In Pillar 1, we have JASPERS, the, the initiative that has helped uh, over the past 14 years to prepare major projects under the EU funds. And in Pillars 2 and 3, we have the European Investment Advisory Hub that will help to prepare projects. In conclusion, let me say that the EIB may support projects outside the above three pillars, and notably projects outside the EU with a just transition dimension, building on our track record on industrial transition projects. The European lessons from coal exits and industrial transition can certainly be brought to fruition elsewhere in the world. If I have focused so much on EU policies here, it is because it has absolute priority for our institution. I have not uh, dealt in detail with the indicators on how we measure transition, but when I saw, I, I might refer to the EBRD slide on, on this uh, reduction in emissions, for example, number of workers trained, number of beneficiaries, we very much have a similar set of, of indicators. So just for completeness, and I stop here. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Hubert. Okay, last but certainly not least, Carolina Herrera, you stuck in there for a number of presentations uh, and want to get some of the views of your work and N uh, NRDC's work uh, on thinking about the role of green banks and development banks in the energy transition and how you're starting to incorporate just transition into how you think about that and, and, and NDCs. So please, Carolina, thank you very much. Well, th Thank you so much for the opportunity to join the event and, and sort of join this discussion. It's really been some fascinating um, uh, presentations that I'm eager to sort of learn more about. Um, so I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, you can sort of just skip to, to the next slide. Um, I'm going to be looking at uh, Chile and Mexico to basically explore three sort of general ideas for what might be needed to form part of a just transition in Latin America and how this idea of transitioning certain institutions to green investment banks um, could fit in. Um, so the first is that just transitions in Latin America uh, obviously do need to look at fossil fuels, but also other aspects of the energy sector, including energy access and obviously other productive sectors that are gonna have to undergo 
um, you know, very rapid transitions like the forestry and agricultural sector that Anna was was um, mentioning. Um, and there's also just the other the other point is that there's been a lot of climate work in the region focused on clean energy transitions to reduce emissions, but discussions about what the equity considerations might be for for people and sectors. Um, not just from climate change, but also climate change solutions sometimes seem to be parallel conversations. And these are gonna to have to be brought together um, very rapidly. And then the third point is that since the transitions that are gonna be needed um, to address climate change are really about long-term development strategies, it's gonna be very important to align the mandates and, and strategies of the local development finance institutions um, with the types of transformations that will be necessary similarly to the two examples that we were just um, hearing to hearing about. Um, looking at Chile, this is, you know, a, a country where the energy sector, broadly speaking, is by far the largest greenhouse gas emitter. 40% uh, of Chile's electricity generation is coal-based, so coal represents about 25% of total emissions. And these coal plants are located in six municipalities that are often cited as examples of sacrifice zones where there's multiple polluting industries and the air quality doesn't meet uh, sort of environmental standards. So the coal phase down in Chile is a key measure for achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, but also for achieving greater social justice. And in 2018, the Ministry of Energy and the coal companies reached a voluntary agreement to phase out uh, coal. And last year in, in June, they announced that all 28 existing coal plants would be shut down or reconverted by 2040. Uh, so by the first phase of this, 2024, Chile expects to have shut down 11 coal plants. Uh, and sort of the longer term, this schedule is going to be revisited every five years to determine dates for, for the remaining plants. Prior to, to this announcement of the, of, the, um, uh, of the shutdown schedule that was ultimately agreed on bilateral, with uh, bilateral conversations, there was a multi-stakeholder working group that analyzed the impacts of the phase out on security and economic efficiency of the electric system on sort of the local economic activity and some of the local environmental and social factors. So however fast the shutdown occurs, this, this concept of what a just transition might look like is now very much part of the conversation. Um, and as Ana was, was mentioning a, a couple of months ago in June, Chile launched a process to create a strategy for a just transition in energy. And there's approximately about 14,000 impacted workers in the communities where these plants are, are, um, are located between direct and indirect workers. But the goal of the thinking and the strategy does seem to be to consider a jobs transition, yes, and, and where these workers can sort of uh, you know, transition to, but also look at other needs and investments in the communities to improve uh, conditions there. So the strategy creation is gonna be done through a participatory process and, and, and through dialogues. The first draft uh, of, of the strategy itself is expected in December of this year. Uh, then there'll be a public consultation process and then it'll actually be published in the first half of, of uh, next year. Uh, and then the strategy will provide a framework for the later development of local action plans in each of the affected uh, communities to identify sort of the specific needs there and, and actions. Um, but there are other sectors in energy that, in, in energy that Chile is going to have to start thinking about just transition for. Um, you know, some people were mentioning, you know, what, what a just transition will look like in, in transportation. This is very much the case in, in uh, Chile, where there's, you know, a, a desire to advance a, the electric vehicle sector rapidly. Um, but also, for example, what it will mean when manufacturing uh, industries start moving towards new energy sources. There's, you know, plans in the government to uh, really sort of uh, move forward with, with green hydrogen, as they call it. Um, and then in the residential sector, there's a recent energy transition strategy for the residential energy sector, which sort of specifies that areas where that strategy needs to be implemented also need to develop local action plans to ensure a just transition. And the context there is that wood burning is actually the main fuel source for residential heating in Chile. So how, uh, you know, as, as that sector becomes more regulated and you know, it shifts to other heating alternatives. How do you ensure energy cost is accessible for communities? And the wood, uh, you know, the informal wood fuel workforce is, is sort of protected from these changes. Um, and the next slide. 
And then in Mexico, just very briefly, again, similar to Chile, very high uh, fossil fuel dependency, but the difference here is that unlike Chile that doesn't have its own fossil fuels, Mexico has Pemex, a state oil and gas company, that's a major source of annual rent revenue for, for the government. And there's been a lot of work in, Chile, in, in Mexico on what a clean transition needs uh, in terms of the policy, the financial instruments, the market instruments. And what sort of happened is that as that's moved forward, certain social dimensions were not always necessarily part of the clean energy discussion. So for example, um, you know, how to actually be using clean energy to alleviate poverty or support economic development. So some of the groups that are starting to um, work on just transition concepts in, in Mexico, it's not a new concept, but it's certainly less extended. Um, have been pointing to the need for obviously first the imperative to move away from fossil fuels, but also need to do this in a way that is advancing these broader development goals. And that may mean strengthening certain policies related to evaluating the social impacts of projects, the planning of the, of the energy sector, consultation processes, but also starting to conceive of projects in different scales. So uh, smaller distributed generation projects, um, you know, with different types of ownership, maybe even collective ownership to really be ensuring that local communities are sharing in the benefits. And obviously the other, the other energy transition there is the fossil fuel sector, what that means for, for jobs in BEMEX, but also what does it mean if Pemex is exposed to external uh, you know, climate risk, climate transition risks, and because they sort of, they, they, uh, are, they represent such an important part of the overall national budget, how does that then flow to state and local levels? And what does that mean for the provision of, of, of social services as part of a just climate transition? Um, so finally, kind of looking at the case of, of, of Mexico and sort of the role of one particular NDP there. We really do think that national development banks as local uh, development finance institutions can play a key role for advancing climate transitions in Latin America. They already have the role of economic development and social inclusion, and they can be transformational as some of the other speakers were saying, um, if they integrate climate considerations and are mobilizing financing sort of the types of projects that are aligned with the Par Paris Agreement, um, and are, are bringing along the commercial banking sector as well. And there's one case of uh, Banobras, which is sort of the, the infrastructure and public's work uh, development bank. And they have a sustainable bank strategy that they have been developing over the past few years and implementing that's focused on accessing capital through sustainable bonds and climate funds that they can use for sustainable projects. Uh, they've been implementing an environmental and social risk management system to sort of mitigate some of the impacts that, their pro that the projects um, may be having on communities. And they're also uh, focusing on trying to identify green projects, but that also have a very high social impact. And one interesting thing with this particular bank is that because they can work with states and municipalities, this is a way to sort of be able to also finance some of the sustainable projects that are being identified at that local level and really move those, move those forward. The work, and you can go to the next slide, please. The work NRDC has been doing over the past uh, few years in Latin America uh, with regards to green finance has particularly been focused on how the model of green investment banks, those sort of specialized financial institutions that are focused on green sectors and market development can be adapted for the region. And, and in our view in Latin America, uh, given the sort of the current context of, of existing national development institutions, we're really see, seeing that this means reorienting some of these existing institutions to behave more like green banks. And that essentially sort of boils down to, uh, you know, making sure that these institutions have the mandate to focus their efforts and funds on particular sectors and meet certain metrics, whether it's new jobs in the clean energy sector, uh, you know, creating the capacities both internally of specialized teams, but also externally, so that you know any TA can, you know any assistance can be can be provided to communities or elsewhere to to identify and design projects, and obviously bringing together the capital both from public funds, of, whether it's their own or from international climate finance, uh, or private sources, whether it's commercial banks um, or uh, issuing green bonds, which Banobras has been has been doing over the past several years, and I think uh, I'll I'll leave it at that, given the time.
That's great. Wonderful. Thank you, Carolina. I think that's such an interesting perspective. Um, and, and thanks for staying on time, too. Uh, if, if we have uh, we have enough time, if you each can respond with, you know, one or two minute answers, I'm going to try and get each of you a question. Um, and, and I'll tell you all of them now. So you'll kind of be working on the your response and the brevity of your response. But um, Barbara, there was a question about sort of incorporating these frameworks and the planning into to the just transitions uh, 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 strategy and approach. So if you could talk a little bit about that uh, in, in sort of thinking about the framework uh, for, for incorporating some of these issues. Um, and then Uber, if you could talk about the pipeline, I mean, it's such a huge amount of money uh to be sort of funneling in, in uh, into these uh exercises and and what does the project pipeline look like and is it is it adequate and then carolina i was really struck by you know the focus that nrdc has on sort of reorienting the national development banks it just strikes me that there's so much uh regional development planning that has gone into and was talked about in the context of the ebrd eib approach how much of a gap do you see uh, in how much capacity building would these banks have to do in terms of just getting these regional development plans incorporated as part of as, as part of what they're doing and how big of a lift is that? So maybe we'll go Barbara Uber and then Carolina. And if you can keep them quick, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Um, so if, if we look at um, developing broader frameworks and looking at some of the challenges also, um, of, of, of integrating just transition into larger regional um, um, frameworks. I think there are a number of things to, to consider. The first one, um, if you go into a region, if you work with, with your stakeholders in a, in a particular country, I think timing is very important. It is all about when does that happen? Uh, look at what is the election timetable? You know, what, what is coming up politically, economically? What are, what are the other circumstances that, that this country faces? So I think timing is important. The second one is um, an agreement on which actions to take. Um, and here, um, we, we already have some experience having worked with, with some of our partners where um, um, maybe the expectations are at, the, at, at the local level initially and, and the responses that would be put forward uh, may not necessarily be very long term. It may be, it may be about um, uh, forcing incoming companies to employ people um, who, may, who were let go or who lose their, their livelihoods uh, from that transition. That um, is very often not a very sustainable um, approach to be taken. Um, and then to actually move away and move the discussion towards um, longer term uh, um, approaches that are very much more embedded into longer term regional development, economic development uh, can be hard. Um, a third point is, is about the difficulties of attracting um, inward investment. Uh, it really depends on the region, it depends on the economic opportunities in a given region. Um, and then the fourth one is um, we need to understand the wider um, regional challenges, particularly when we look at depopulation in, in our countries of operation. There are entire regions that, that, that are depopulating at an unprecedented uh, scale where people don't even move to, to their capital anymore, but move straight out of the country and sometimes even out of the region. So these are huge flows. These are huge um, demographic um, and economic challenges that these regions face, which in a way get beyond the just transition um, challenges, but need to be addressed and need to be considered when we actually want to create a, a viable uh, just transition plan um, as part of a, a regional development plan. Thank you very much, Barbara. Uber, on the, uh, on the project pipeline. On the pipeline, you are right to ask this question. The amounts are gigantic and we need to fill it uh, with projects or our member states need to fill it with projects. And this is indeed uh, problematic in some places, especially in, in regions and countries where promoter capacity is not known to be to, to be state of the art. Um, and this is why, why we need advisory services to help uh, build a project pipeline. And this is very much where we see the EIB's role a big since uh, the just transition plans are set up without direct participation of the EIB by the countries and regions, uh, the just transition plans are really relatively high level. And to translate these plans into concrete projects, it will take it will take some some help, and governments will have to sit down again. So having a territorial just transition plan is not enough. However, we have some visibility on investment needs in several regions, thanks to our advisory involvement. Uh, for example, I mentioned Jaspers before. Uh, the, the Jaspers service of the EIB has helped the coal regions in transition platform. 
uh, to screen projects in th in three Polish uh, coal mining regions, but also in the Slovak Republic and in the Czech Republic. And um, from from the from these three exercises, there are a few high level lessons to take. One is that you could easily use up all your money with energy projects because the challenges are so tremendous in 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 energy efficiency but also in changing the energy mix that you can, could easily use up all the money so uh, it's it's not so difficult to use that those billions but if you do so of course you will have net job losses so you need a, a really a, a balanced strategy to cater both to the energy needs and to the to the job market needs what we also know is that ecologic regeneration is extremely expensive for example the lusatia um, brown coal area um, the, co the, the state-owned company that is in charge of regenerating the area and of managing the transition from active mining into regenerated places has spent 10 billion euros over the past 20 years into afforestation regeneration cleaning up the sites 10 billion euros the ib modestly supported these efforts with two loans uh, amounting to 500 million together so and for example germany's three major lignite basins they have relatively detailed investment plans to to cushion the coal exit by 2038 and that will consume 40 billion in federal grants so the projects are there, but they need to be driven by good promoters and need to be developed. And Silesia also has a huge investment plan, uh, quite detailed already. Thank you, Brad. That's very, uh, very interesting. Carolina, we're going to give you the, the final answer here. Um, great. Thank you. So I, I would say just quickly, um, your to the, the, the banks, the national development banks, they know their sectors that they're focused on and their regions the best. So in that sense, there's a lot of knowledge there already. There will definitely need to be sort of a, filling a gap of, you know, what, what are the capacities and the tools that are necessary to finance specific particular technologies or solutions. Uh, there's going to need to be sort of a gap that needs to be filled in terms of strengthening participatory processes and making sure that the banks are involved uh, early on in the development of, you know, what, what the, what the action plans might be or what the what the regional development plans might be to make sure that types of considerations that will come up once a project gets to the bank are being considered early early enough in the process um, and and there's also going to have to be a gap that's filled with relation to uh, you know how environmental and social risks are being managed from you know internally in in the bank so there's definitely certain gaps in, in capacity that are going to have to be filled um, as, as part of this process. But again, the, these, these banks have a long history working in their regions and in their particular sectors are often very sectoral based. Um, and so I, I think it's definitely something that, that is gonna be able to, to move forward. Great, thank you. Well, I wish we had all day to be talking uh, more about the, the complexity of these issues that you've raised, but we think it's really, uh, been a great uh, discussion. Uh, you've put a lot on the table for a lot of people who are paying attention and working in these fields themselves. So we will try and find a way to get some of the questions we left on the table answered uh, after the fact. But I just want to say a big thank you to uh, to Uber and to Barbara and to Carolina and to Anna and to Joy for uh, and to and uh, uh, and Margarita for all of uh, your contributions in this conversation. I'm going to quickly turn it over to my colleague uh, uh, Hugh C. Wright uh, from the Climate Investment Funds to to maybe uh, say some closing words. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I realize we're out of time. So just a, a very quick thank you from the Climate Investment Funds. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers um, who, who did an absolutely brilliant job in, in covering a lot of um, critical areas. Um, so it's a work related impact, specifically gender impacts and in informal economy and, and place based events, investments. These are core components of the work that we're doing with CSIS. And um, this was a great insight into many of these, these areas that we'll be looking into um, in the course of the project. I think one clear element that we heard loud and clear from all the speakers um, was the need for multi-stakeholder consultations. Um, it's very clear that no one department or ministry or stakeholder group can get this challenging transition done alone. That's very clear. Um, 
and that's a key motivation for the for the work of the JTI between the CIF and the CSIS. Um, and we hope that um, some of the uh, convening platforms that we're setting up through the JTI will um, help lay the foundation uh, for many of these discussions, um, including some of the case studies that we're doing uh, through the CIF in, in our countries of operation to kind of give that platform for these multi-stakeholder uh, engagements. Um, that's a, a core component of this work. So we really appreciate um, some of the reflections today from the speakers and all the brilliant questions that we received, which we'd we'll be taking on board um, in the, the next phase of the research. So um, thanks once again for taking the time. I realise we're, we're um, up against it here. So just one more thank you from us and um, very much hope you can stay engaged with the work of the GATI going forward and, and um, you'll be hearing from us in the future. So thanks so much again, everybody.